Amen. Please be seated. I can't tell you specifically what part of the Bible to open your Bibles, but open your Bibles somewhere because you don't want it to be closed. Open your Bibles and open your hearts to what God has to say to us this morning because we're going to be going from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. In fact, as we were saying that song, it just reminded me of the scene in the book of Revelation, the vision that, that the Apostle John received. And after the chapters 2 and 3 were the letters to the churches, and it says, in chapter 4, it says, he said, I saw heaven open. And he saw this vision of God in there in the middle of, uh, he's surrounded by the 24 elders representing probably the, the apostles, the apostolic age, and also the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel surrounding him. And he says, myriads and myriads or thousands upon thousands of angels. And all this glorious singing going on and all this praising. And then he said, and in chapter 5, he says, there was this scroll uh, that, that was sealed. It was the title deed to the earth. And he said, and I cried and I cried, John says, because of all the, 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 the people who were there, the creatures who were uh, in, in, in the scene around God. He says, no one, not amongst the angels, not amongst the 24 elders and who they represent, no one could open the scroll. And so John just cried and cried and the angel came up to him and says, do not cry. For there is a man of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, who is able to open the scroll. And he said in, in verse 5, he said, And I looked and I saw the Lamb of God as it's been slain, standing on the earth. That's the confidence that we can have. No matter what goes on in life, we know that Jesus Christ is coming back. And He is, he is standing and He will stand and He will rule and He will reign. And nothing in this world can ever change that. And by the way, if you're really upset about things that's going on in this world, yes, we need to be upset about a lot of things that's going on. But don't be upset like people who have no foundation and who have no confidence in who Christ is. Listen to this. This, because this is what the Bible teaches. There is no government edict. There is no army in this world by any government or all of the governments put together can ever, ever, ever usurp the power and the authority and the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will rule and He will reign. He's allowing us to go through what we're going through today so that then, in fact, in 2 Peter, He does, He did, people ask Peter uh, or accuse the Lord of being slow in keeping His promise. Since the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some people say, he is patient because it is not his desire that anyone would perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. And really, that's when we talk about Christmas. I hope my prayer for the people of God, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, for us here at College Hills, is not that we are divorced from the person and the work, the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's actually only in Him can we find the greatest fulfillment, the greatest joy that you can have in the season. As I was telling Dylan and Melanie and the grandparents earlier, they could buy Jeremiah and we could buy each other the nicest gifts and you can spend a lot of money on everyone. You'll just owe money on them. Those toys will break down. Those fancy gizmos that you buy, like iPods or whatever, the i you ever notice why they're called iPods, iPads, iPhones? <coughs> the i You know what happened a year from now? Your birthday will be old and you will be lusting after a new one. So, what does the world have to offer to us? Nothing. But in Christ, even the meagerest, even the most meager of meals, and even the lowliest of homes can be a mansion of Christ is there, can be abundance, can be a feast. I was thinking about Tracy, what, what she said earlier about uh, how we, our culture, the way we have celebrated Christmas. I was really 
fascinated, sad, saddened uh, by what happened this last Friday. And in a lot of places I saw on different news outlets what, what had happened. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if Christians would actually stand in line at 4 o'clock in the morning, the church doors, waiting for our church doors to open on Sunday morning? I know you're going, oh yeah, sure. Wouldn't it be great if we could put forth the kind of passion for the Lord Jesus Christ as we do for the, the newest gadgets that, come, that, that they're offering in these stores? But oftentimes that's not what happens. And, and in our world today, there's a worsening of the culture, worse and worse. And I know you all know that, and, and I just... I just want to remind us of that because next, really, for the month of December, we will again revisit a familiar story, the familiar story, but hopefully the story that never gets old for any of us. And that is about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He means to us. Uh, too often, I think we get, even evangelicals, we get duped or we get deceived into thinking that we can process change and we can affect change through the political process. And we made a mistake in the 1970s when evangelicals in the United States thought, you know, we've got a Southern Baptist running for president who even taught Sunday school from Plains, Georgia, so let's do that. Well, whatever you thought you think of Jim Carter, he was not the answer to evangelicalism's desires. So, in the midst of that frustration, out of that frustration was birthed the moral majority. We, the moral majority of people said, we will elect a president who, who, who reflects our values. Ronald Reagan was a product of that movement. And of course, Ronald Reagan, as much as a lot of people liked him, he still did not affect the changes that evangelicals thought that they could affect through the political system. Because really, if we had been wise enough, we would understand from the Word of God that those kinds of changes cannot be effected through the political system. It is only as each individual heart is changed with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why it should never be old for us what the Gospel message is. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is us simply looking back and singing about Silent Night. We need to understand what Michael was talking about, and I appreciate, Michael, your heart to always point us to really what Christmas means. Because too often what we have, what, what has happened with Christmas with us uh, for Christmas, uh, during this time of, of the year is that we have just kind of nurtured what it is that makes us feel good. Chuck Colson, almost 20 years ago, wrote a book called Against the Night, Living in the New Dark Ages. Let me just read to you part of what he wrote. He said recently, a neighbor told me how excited she was about her church. When I tried to point out diplomatically that the group was a cult, believing in neither the resurrection nor the deity of Christ, she seemed unconcerned. Oh, but the services are so wonderful, quote unquote. I always feel so good after I've been there. Such misguided euphoria has always been rampant among those spirit seeking spiritual strokes rather than a source of truth. But what about the church itself? That body of people called out to embody God's truth. Most of the participants in this guy who was doing the survey, this study, his name is Robert Bella. Most of the participants in Robert Bella's study saw, listen to this, saw the church as a means to achieve personal goals. Bella notes a similar tendency in many evangelical circles to thin the biblical language of sin and redemption to an idea of Jesus as a friend who helps us find happiness and self-fulfillment. He's a friend who can help you when you need him. He makes you feel better. But Jesus is a lot more than that, as we will find. I want us to do this morning, just to do an overview in the short time that we have, 
And I know some of you are thinking, you're going to do an overview of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In 20 minutes or less. Well, let's try it. Let's try it. First, let me begin in Genesis 3. Okay, you can turn to Genesis 3. This is what we call, what theologians call the Proto-Evangelium. Proto means first. Evangelium is the good news. It's a Latin term for the same thing as event or the, the good news. Uh, Evangelium. When God was judging Satan, Lucifer, in Genesis chapter 3, and he said that your that you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. You will bruise his heel. Speaking about the seed of the woman, this is the first mention of the, the good news that God, instead of simply dealing with man according to what man deserved in Genesis 3, God had already said, if you, when you, eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And that's what should have happened. And they died spiritually. They were separated from God. They were driven from the garden. But even in the midst of that, instead of just judging the, the man and the woman, God pronounces this, uh, this promise of the, by the seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 6, when after God had, had pronounced the, the iniquity and the, the evil in this world as overwhelming, it says that every intent in the heart of men was nothing but evil and wicked all the time, meaning that there was not an ounce, there was not a second of righteousness in man, in any man at that time. God breaks through with His grace. Yesterday, uh, Bill and Melanie, I was looking for a child's Bible that, or maybe a child, some simpler stories. And I was at the Christian bookstore. And I looked at a lot of them. Finally, just went and got that little Bible because it is the Word of God. And it, it amazes me how we have, we will change the very meaning not only the Word of God, but the very meaning of the Word of God. I saw one where it says the simplified, the Genesis account simplified. It says, in the beginning God created everything beautiful. And then it says, but man messed everything up or something like that. And then God looked, and Gen talking about Genesis 6, and God looked, and everybody was evil and wicked except for one man. And it says, and God addressing Noah, and it says, Noah, you're the only one left who is still good. That's not, not what the Bible says. And yet we pay for it in our Christian bookstores. What does the Bible say? Genesis 6 says, Every intent in the heart of man was nothing but evil and wicked all the time. That means including Noah and his family were wicked. But we think him deserving of grace because he was good. No, he wasn't. He was evil. Just like everyone else. That if, if, because that's what the meaning of grace is, isn't it? It is undeserved favor from God. Genesis 6, 8 says this, But Noah found favor, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't because he was good, but it's because God said, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to grant you grace. And then, of course, in verse 9 says that Noah was righteous and blameless. Now, I know I always say this, what is obvious in the text. What comes first, verse 8 or verse 9? Y'all tell me. Hey. So the grace of the Lord bestowed on Noah came first before he was declared as righteous. Because his righteousness did not come from him. It came as a favor, as a grace, as something that was given by God. And then he responded by faith to that. And then he became then a, a, a foreshadowing type of Christ and that he obeyed because after that, after verses 8 and 9, you will find that Noah doing everything that the Lord had commanded him to do. Meaning, in the same way as, he, as, as his life looked forward to what Christ was going to do. He was that. In Genesis 12, when God called another payment, people would say, well, he was a good man. No, he wasn't. Guess where Abraham came from? 
from the land of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. You can trace in the scriptures Jerusalem, Babylon. You can trace them from Genesis all the way to Revelation. There is the city that God is going to judge. The city of Babylon and then there's Jerusalem. And you can trace them all the way until you get to Revelation 17 and 18 where Babylon, the monarch of our harlots, is, is going to be judged. God calls a pagan out of Chaldea, out of Babylon. And as he responded by, uh, to God's grace, and God then tells him in Genesis chapter 12 that through your seed all of the nations will be blessed. Again, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 22, we see a picture of the Lord Jesus in Isaac. When, when God, when, when his father, when Abraham, when God commanded his father Abraham to offer him as a sacrifice to him. And you see him, he was as good as dead. In fact, before Abraham and Isaac went up to the mountain, you remember what Abraham told his, his servants. He said, wait here until we return. He used the, the pronoun we, meaning that he knew what God had already commanded him to do was to kill his son as a sacrifice. And yet he had the confidence that God was somehow in his will, in his sovereign will, will accomplish that which the human mind cannot comprehend, that he will bring back his son. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ was put in the grave and then he resurrected three days later. And then, of course, we, will, we look forward to his coming again. And then Genesis 37 through 50, we see Joseph, another picture of Christ. Who was given up for dead. His brothers knew that they faked his death. As far as Jacob was concerned, his son was dead. And he was taken into captivity, into exile, into Egypt. And there he became the savior of his people. And so you see, even in the book of Genesis, the pictures of Christ. And I'm not, I'm just mentioning a, a few, few of those pictures, those, those foreshadowings. Of Christ in the, in the in the book of Isaiah next week, uh, Fred is going to be doing a uh, teaching from Isaiah chapter seven, and then after that we will look at Isaiah chapter nine, and then on the twenty second we will look at the Christmas story in Luke twenty two, and then we will finish off with 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 uh, uh, put the whole thing together. But in the book of Isaiah, it has a lot of the prophecies regarding Christ. Let me just mention to you some of the ones specifically talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 49, verse 1, it proclaims this, Jesus as the Messiah will be called before His birth to be God's servant. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that He will be born of a virgin. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 10, that He will be a descendant of Jesse and thus in the Davidic line. In 11, 2 and 42, 1, he will be empowered, that Jesus will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. In chapter 42 of Isaiah, verse 3, he will be gentle toward the weak. In 50, verses 4 through 9, he will be obedient to the Lord in his mission. In 50, verse 6 and 53, 7 through 8, he will voluntarily submit to suffering. In 49, 7 and 53, verses 1 and 3, he will be rejected by the nation of Israel. In chapter 53, verses 4 through 6 and 10 through 12, he will take on himself the sins of the world. In, verse, in chapter 53, verse 10, he will triumph over death. In verse 52, verse 13, in verse 12 of chapter 53, he will be exalted. In 61, verses 1 and 3, he will come to comfort Israel and bring vengeance on the wicked. In 49, verse 3, he will, Jesus will manifest God's glory. In 49, 5, he will restore Israel spiritually to God. And then in 49, 8, and he will also restore uh, Israel physically to the land. In chapter 9, verse 7, he will reign on David's throne. In chapter 9, verse 2, he will bring joy to Israel. In chapter 42, verse 6 and 49, 8 through 9, he will make a new covenant with Israel. In 42, verse 6, 49, verse 6, he will be a light to the Gentiles. In chapter 11, verse 10, he will restore the nations. In chapter 19, 19 through 21, 49, 7, and 52, 15, he will be worshipped by Gentiles. 
in chapter 9, verse 6, He will govern the world. He will be ruler of all the world. In chapter 11, verses 3 through 5, 42, 1 and 4, He will judge in righteousness, justice, and faithfulness. Everything you find in the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is about God and His plan of redemption through Christ. Last year, after my surgery, and I had the time where I just, I didn't do anything except read and pray and enjoy the time with Ken, enjoy the time with the Lord and with my wife. It's amazing how God opened my heart and opened my eyes that before I turned in the scriptures, all I was seeing was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have said this to you that the more and more when I study the scriptures, the most profound truth in all of theology is also the most basic, and that is Christ. You can discuss, everyone can discuss, and I read theology books, but anything that speaks of theology apart from Christ is meaningless. Everything points back to Him. Listen to this. You've seen the, 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 the posters, but let me just remind you. In Genesis, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet unto like Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is our judge and our lawgiver. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. In Esther, he is our Mordecai. In Job, he is our ever living redeemer. In Psalms, he is our shepherd, our good shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he is the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he is the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he is our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the most wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in life's fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is the faithful husband even when we are unfaithful to him. In Joel, he is the baptizer with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Amos, he is a burden barrier. In Obadiah, he is the mighty one to save. In Jonah, he is a great foreign missionary. In Micah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he is God's evangelist crying, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In Stephaniah, he is our Savior. In, in Haggai, he is the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. Rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he is the king of the Jews. In Mark, he is the servant. In Luke, he is the son of man, feeling what you feel. In John, he is the son of God. In Acts, he is the savior of the world. In Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he is the rock that followed Israel. In 2 Corinthians, he is the triumphant one. Giving victory in Galatians. He is our liberty. He is our freedom. In Ephesians, He is the head of the church. In Philippians, He is our joy. In Colossians, He is our completeness. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, He is our hope. In 1st Timothy, He is our faith. In 2nd Timothy, He is our stability. In Philemon, He is our benefactor. In Titus, He is our truth. In Hebrews, He is our perfection. In James, He is the power behind our faith. In 1 Peter, He is our example. In 2 Peter, He is our purity. In 1 John, He is our life. He is my life. In 2 John, He is the pattern. He is the model for us. In 3 John, He is our motivation. In Jude, He is the foundation of our faith. And in Revelation, He is the coming King. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. 
the beginning and the end. He is the sustainer of all things. He is our salvation. He is our hope and our future. He is the ever-present God. He is our purpose and our strength. He is our sufficient grace in time of need. He is our provision. He is our daily bread. He is our peace. He is our comfort. He is our song. He is our life. He is our resurrection. He is our comfort in times of grief and sorrow. He is our rock and foundation in the midst of life's greatest storms. He was, He is, and He will always be, for He is the eternal God. He is our freedom. He is our joy. He is the Lamb of God. He was slain for our sins. He was smitten and stricken by God for our rebellion. He is the one the grave could not hold. He is our righteousness. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is life. He is life. No government can ban Him. No human army can defeat Him. That baby born 2,000 years ago held and holds today all of human history in His hands. That baby born 2,000 years ago kept and keeps all of the known universes functioning properly. There is no power in history or in the world that is greater than His power. There is no storm that He cannot calm. There is no sickness that He cannot heal. There is no broken heart that He cannot make whole. There is no sin except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that He will not forgive. He is Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is God's love fully expressed. He is God's grace poured out. He is mercy in flesh and blood. He is Lord. He is our beautiful King. He is coming again to rule and to reign. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. That's who we celebrate at Christmas. As Micah said, not just the baby, but the King of Kings. <coughs> And the Lord of Lords. And Tracy, you are right. There's nothing in the Bible that needs to be fulfilled before the church is raptured out of here. We can go at any moment. Those of us who know Christ. The ones who do not know Christ, you can celebrate Christmas with all the fun, fun fair and, and all the great things that you might think is there. But I tell you, life is empty without Christ. And that is why in probably the most complete book in the Old Testament that speaks of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love beginning at the beginning in chapter 1. When the prophet, when God speaking through the prophet, tells them of their sins and of our sins. And then in, 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 in chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us reach it together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. They Though they are like red, like crimson, they shall become like wool. God is still inviting you to come to Him. For you to have the sense and the meaning of Christmas that could withstand anything that you will face in this life. It means something in eternity. We're about to have the Lord's Supper. Even the observance of the Lord's Supper proclaims what I just proclaimed to you from the Word of God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul tells the church in Corinth this, and he tells us today. He said that, on, that he was passing on to them what the Lord Jesus Christ passed on to him, that on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he said after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this cup is in the covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. When he said do this in remembrance of me twice, in the Gospels, and in 1 Corinthians, he was not talking about for us to simply remember what he did in the cross, maybe to play back 
to re do a replay of the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ in Our Minds of what Christ went through. It is one of the most important theological words in the whole of the Bible that we will remember. Even in the Old Testament, even in the book of Genesis, God would say that He remembered Abraham. And He remembered Noah. And He remembered His people. The word remember always has to do with God acting on the covenant that He has already made. And when you and I, as believers today, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, when the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to do this in remembrance of me, what He wants us to do is not to feel sorry for Him, but to understand that He moved heaven and earth, He clothed Himself in our humanity to fulfill the covenant that He made, beginning when, in the first, when He first said about the seed of the woman, because He is the faithful God. And so when we partake of the Lord's Supper, understand that Jesus came to save us, that He who was without sin became sin for us, that in Him we might have the righteousness of God. Understand that. And understand that apart from Him, there is no hope, there is no future, there is no salvation for any one of us. And that the mercy and grace of God was poured out on the cross. Martin Luther put it this way, that Christ is the face of God seen. And he also wrote that on that cross, grace dripped from the wounds on his side and on his head and in his hands. That's what that means. To look back, and Paul says that in 1 Corinthians, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, he says you look back into what Christ has done and you look forward to his coming again. Guys, we know the end of the story. It's a wonderful end. We live happily ever after with our Savior, with our Lord. Some of you may be wondering where God is. He is faithful. He is good. As He was faithful to fulfill His first coming, He will be faithful in fulfilling His second coming. If you're a guest this morning, I just want to tell you that we practice only communion, which means that you don't have to be a member of College Hills Baptist Church. Please, you have to know Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. And we also do this uh, as families. There is a table in the back. There are two tables here in the front. And if Dad is a believer, I'm asking Dad to lead the family uh, in serving his family and leading them in prayer, thanking the Lord for what He did on the cross, for His sacrifice of His body, and the pouring out of His blood that you and I might be saved. And then just lead Him in a short prayer in that. And if your children are believers, uh, of course let them participate. If they're not believers, please do not let them participate. If there are guests around you, or if there are uh, widows, widowers around you, or single people who are by themselves, invite them to be a part of your family. They may say no, but that's okay. But invite them. Let them be a part of that. The life in the church from the beginning and life in God is always in community. Uh, also, Paul gives us a warning in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, do not partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And meaning that we, we need to confess to God everything, primarily the brokenness of fellowship with other people. But then any sin that is there, just lay it out before the Lord. The promise of God is true. Anyone that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So in a moment, I just want to give you time to bow your heads and spend some time in prayer to the Lord. You actually don't have to bow your heads. I don't know why we say that. Uh, but spend some time in prayer and just ask God to show you where your heart is. There are sins that you need to confess and confess them to the Lord. And then when you and your family are ready, just excuse yourself and the people around you and just make your way either to the back or to the front. And then we will, after everybody is finished with the Lord's Supper, I will dismiss this all together.